I think Tekken 8 is pretty good. If you want to know how I feel about it, I'd give you that two-word answer. And if you were to prod me in a way that forces me to elaborate, I'd pretty quickly run into a discussion about how I think it's flawed in ways that I don't think are going to be addressed. I say addressed instead of fixed, because I don't think those flaws are definable as problems, but instead things that go against my preference. Heat Burst and Heat Smash are moves that globally allow the player to force mix-ups. They're not I win buttons, but they are I now control the pace buttons, which I really don't enjoy. It gives almost every character the ability to break out of a situation with very little thought and even less risk. But it's also something that I think is necessary. Tekken 8 has a lot of focus on pressure and the ability to press. While not exemplary in every character, you can find a lot of buttons that let you fast track your way through neutral that end up plus on block. From there, you're likely to be put into a mix-up, likely through a stance that if guessed incorrectly, leads back into the situation repeating. These are aspects that did exist in Tekken 7, but have been amplified in 8, and I'd imagine they're going to be stuck to when at the Tekken World Tour in 2013, they specifically mention that the game was built with aggression in mind. I think Tekken is more interesting from a passive play perspective, and so while I can enjoy the fact that sidestepping has been buffed, I don't particularly enjoy being not only encouraged, but rewarded to press my way through someone's defense, as opposed to baiting out options. I'd imagine, like all Tekken games, as the skill level improves, the game becomes more and more about solid defense and passive play, but from the level that I'm playing at, I have issues with how the game typically operates. I'm still enjoying myself a lot of the time, but when I'm playing matches where both me and my opponent are getting rewarded for pressing a lot and forcing mix-ups, I kind of wish I was playing any other fighting game. I think Tekken 8 is great once you've finally learnt a matchup so thoroughly that the mix-up is just a smaller part of a larger mind game, but its prevalence before and in many cases after you've achieved a deeper level of understanding have me needing to weigh that against a lot of moments that just aren't what I think the game does well. It's pretty good, but I don't feel a particular need to air that out on a larger platform, which is something I did, but very much regret with Guilty Gear Strive. It's really hard to review a fighting game, or at least it's hard to review a fighting game in a way that remains valuable or relevant to all audiences. You can extrapolate this statement out to a lot of different genres, especially MMOs, MOBAs, RTS games, and unfortunately a lot of live service battle pass give me a mother's credit card garbage, which some fighters have started to dabble in, but that's a discussion for when you're older and I'm hopefully dead. However, excluding a select few RTS games and, like, Counter-Strike, I think that fighting games are acutely incapable of being held up to the same scrutiny that most games can be. As a product that you buy in exchange for a conventional service of entertainment, sure, I think that it would be relevant to say that I considered 50 hours of Tekken 8 a worthwhile purchase, and I can slot a lot of other games like Street Fighter 6 or King of Fighters into their own judgments, but I don't think my experience could be remotely representative of other people's, and eventually, once I'm 100 hours deep, even mine. For example, Guilty Gear XR Rev 2 is a game that I love. I might even be so controversial as to say it's okay. If tomorrow it disappeared from my game library, I'd happily buy it again, but I don't think I'm realistically a good person to be recommending it to other people. I like this game as a game I already know. I climbed the mountain of knowledge with other people and could find games on my level when I was learning it for the first time round, which shaped my positive experience with it. However, many years on, I can't tell you what it's like to climb the mountain that's learning the first few hours anymore. Not because I can't distinctly remember giving up on Venom to learn Batman only to run it back years later, but because I don't know how many people are still there to learn alongside you. For fighting games, I think this is a very pressing issue, and I'm putting that in quotation marks. Please imagine I'm stretching my little fingies. Especially for games like Marvel 3, and titles that are drastically different between casual, competent, and competitive play, where the experience is in part dictated by the people around you and whether or not you enjoy the learning process. I do not which for me leaves me wary of learning new games that also don't have a new influx of players to play alongside. 
I need those little victories to keep my ego satisfied to keep going. It's a flaw within myself, but it's also a flaw that exists in many people. Nice voice crack, wow. Even if I was confident in reviewing a game for that type of audience, not inherently casual, but someone who isn't looking for something to play long term, anything that I would say about a game could potentially be misconstrued as a discussion aimed towards people who are playing long term. Or worse, be used by the inevitable army of weirdos on both sides who are trying to downplay people's frustration with a game, or demolish the good time that people are having. I think that's my biggest gripe with the Strive review. I was insecure about the inevitable get good comments, and so I showed how I'd achieved the top rank at the time as if to say, I know what I'm talking about, when really I should have been trying to say, I've played enough to know what I like and what I don't like. People then went on to use that from both ends of the spectrum, and my opinion would start to be positioned in a right or wrong perspective because of my own poor understanding of how I'd framed the discussion. That's on me, and to any of the Strive fans who had to suffer infuriating conversations because of it, I'm sorry, I didn't realise that I would encourage these fucking morons to keep being fucking morons. I hate these people. Let people enjoy their fucking toys, please. I like my toys, you like your toys, for the love of fucking God. There's a lot that I regret about that video, especially contributing to a negative sentiment around the game that I just, I don't think was necessary. But I think that trying to critique it with respect to a higher level play was a mistake even if I had achieved a level of competence. Reviewing football as a game would seem ridiculous at this point in time. It's a set of rules that has developed its own culture, and whether or not you see something as good or bad within it oftentimes isn't worth critiquing unless you're in it for the long haul of directly engaging with it on a daily basis. People that like football, yeah, should probably have a conversation about VAR. If you aren't that guy, then let's be honest, why do you care? From the outside looking in, I could try to argue that uh, the offside rule reduces diversity of on-the-fly strategies or some shit like that. And even though I would be wrong, even a well-justified argument wouldn't be worth it if I happened to be right. Like everything else, football as a game, a set of rules and systems, is neutral. Players might be encouraged by the rules to act in a particular way or push some strategies to be more effective than others, but the outcome of the rules isn't inherently good or bad. I might not like that football is a game where four goals in a match is a high scoring game, and while it might be accurate to say that I don't like it, it wouldn't be accurate to say that that is a bad thing. Those who have a love of the game will experience that as a natural byproduct of the game. It's not even something that really gets questioned. They're going to have gripes with aspects and strategies that exist within the framework that the game creates, not the framework itself. On the timescale of fighting games, this is where many of them end up. Most people will experience them in their first month, but a lot of the people who are going to draw the most value from the title will experience it when it's most unlikely to change. Sure, a lot of those communities are tiny. Rising Thunder especially springs to mind, which is a little sad to me. I think it's got a lot of cool ideas in there, and the stripped back nature means that you're engaging with the opponent quicker than other fighting games, or at least you would if Bobzilla hadn't found some incomprehensible mix-ups. But when games reach that unchanging state with a slower trickle in and out of a community, that's where I worry about the position that a review holds. Third Strike is a game that's regarded so highly, the people I know who have never played it consider it to be one of the greatest fighting games of all time. I don't know what they would think of it if they put some serious time into it, but I would imagine that many of them would bear the brunt of its oppressiveness and give it more leeway than they usually would, or disregard their own negative experiences in the learning process because they know about its wider cultural expectation. It's not a game that has prominent reviews, but it does have a very prominent cultural standing. Marvel Infinite is a game that is so poorly regarded at launch that it has never been able to shake its inability to screenshot well, to the point where people I know who have never played it consider it one of the worst fighting games of all time. Speak to many of those who are actively playing it though, and they'll probably tell you that it was an underappreciated gem. If you go into it wanting Marvel 3, that's not what you're going to find, and it's what put me off of it years ago. But that shouldn't discard the fact that there's a lot to like about Infinite. Combo routes are still extremely creative, and the active tag mechanic makes characters intertwine in a way that's very different from the previous entry. However, 
Due to the pretty substantial negative initial reception, it's much harder to convince people to get in the door, and people are more likely to bounce from the title once a negative experience occurs in the learning process. That's not to say that Marvel Infinite's release should be exempt from critique. I'll never forget the eggs or what could have been a really fun invitational tournament if it wasn't effectively the only major that the game ever got. The issue is that that history and legacy is now baggage for a game that exists without any of those elements. Nobody in 2024 is playing Marvel Infinite and thinking, this game's great, but the eggs are full of macroplastics. That's the concern and reason that I probably won't be reviewing Tekken 8, or Street Fighter 6, or any fighting game in the future that I'm primarily negative about, or in like my thoughts, not even just necessarily like how I feel about the game. For as much as I might dislike a game or merely think that it could be described as mid, my opinion of a game that I might put below 100 hours into shouldn't have any impact whatsoever on the people who are going to put so many thousands of hours into a game that they aren't tracking the amount of time that they've played, but how well they performed at their last couple of tournaments. Those people have a love of the game that's on par with those of football fans. They're not blind to the structures that their game is built upon, they care about the game that's crafted inside of it. And reviews that might come across as definitive judgement on whether a game is good or not from a platform of even my main channel size has an influence on the preconceived notion of people who go into it, or if they even decide to give it a shot at all. I've got no doubt that there's someone out there listening to this now who is seeing all of this as the point of a review, and to you, I don't disagree, but when fighting games exist at the balance between product and sport, I don't think it's fair to cast judgement that only really affects those who care the most. A purchase you regret can be refunded, or at worst is a blip of a bad time, but something that provides you with joy that you have to defend because a guy with a bigger number said isn't worth caring for shifts the scale of discussion towards a weighted negativity. For as much as I love being a hater, I've got nothing but respect for the love of the game, whatever game that may be. And if not sharing my negative thoughts allows those who find joy in a title to do so more freely, then that's unquestionably a good thing.